It was here that Dart police recently arrested a 10-year-old carrying a gun. Well, for this series, we've talked to ATF agents, police, and teenagers about the wide availability of guns for criminals and young people, and all of them are very concerned about growing gun violence among teenagers. A growing supply of ever more deadly cheap firearms leaves a bloody trail of violence in North Texas. The shooters and victims get younger and younger. If you want a gun, it's real easy to either go to your friend's house or just go to a gun show and buy a gun and you won't be investigated. Dallas police alone confiscated more than 3,000 guns so far this year. Young people under 24 possessed one-fourth of those crime guns. They have all these 9 millimeters and other kind of handguns uh, that's easy to hide in your clothes or whatever and bring it to the schools. Gun arrest in Dallas includes 75 juveniles between the ages of 10 and 17, according to a tracing analysis done by the ATF at News 8's request. Two shootings involving kids occurred at the West End Dart Station in recent months. A few weeks ago, transit police arrested a 10-year-old boy here who was armed with a powerful handgun. It's a big concern for me, uh, especially in, in uh, regards to all the school shootings that there have been in recent months. What it does is it makes you have to become even more aware of your surroundings, even if you have small children around. You have to be aware that they could possibly be carrying one also. ATF agent Tom Crowley demonstrates the high-capacity 9mm semi-automatic pistol like the one carried by the 10-year-old. If I'm a criminal or I'm a, a kid, where, am I, where can I go to easily buy a gun and nobody's going to ask how old I am and I want a gun that's untraceable? No paperwork. You could do it almost any way. You go through the newspaper, you could go to a gun show, you go to a flea market. Well, again, you could uh, have somebody you know purchase uh -huh. the weapons for them. Dallas Police Officer Larry Dyer tracks where the guns come from. Every gun recovered from a Dallas crime scene now gets traced by the ATF under a new program called the Youth Crime Gun Interdiction Initiative. I've been on the department now for 13 years and I just had no idea uh, that, you know, that this many guns were out there. And like I said, these are just the ones that we recover. So it really, it, you know, makes you really, really wonder um, how many guns are out there? The ATF's National Tracing Center in Falling Waters, West Virginia, found that many Dallas crime guns originally came from legitimate dealers in the city. That's contrary to a widely held belief that most crime guns are stolen. 1,200 firearms, that's one-third of Dallas crime guns, were recovered in four zip codes located in South Dallas, Oak Cliff, and Pleasant Grove neighborhoods, according to ATF tracing. The tracing also shows that the Lorson 380 semi-automatic is the crime gun of choice in Dallas. What makes this so popular with criminals? The expense. It's, it's very inexpensive. This would cost me uh, what? Uh, this would cost you $50 on the street. $50. Uh, you use it, uh, you throw it away. Um, they're just very inexpensive. It even feels and looks cheap here, and like, kind of like a tin can or but it will kill you just as dead as a $400 handgun. A Larson 380 pistol was used to kill two women during a parking lot robbery at the AMC Grand Theater. The gun was legally purchased at a pawn shop in Pleasant Grove three weeks before the murders. Now, because of those problems, Easy Pawn has stopped selling guns. We also checked with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and the Dallas Morning News about their policies on running classified ads for gun sales, uh, neither including the Morning News, which is owned by the same parent company that owns WFAA, uh, does any kind of background check. Now, tomorrow night I'll have a story on a law that is designed to keep guns out of the hands of criminals, but there's a big loophole that may have resulted in the death of a North Texas police officer. John? All right. Thanks a lot, Robert. Convicted felon Lowell Wilson ran an arms bazaar out of a flea market. You're watching an ATF video of the North Texas arms trafficker selling guns to undercover agents. 
The ATF says Wilson illegally sold more than 5,000 new guns and countless used ones on weekends at the Seagoville flea market. Out of those guns, the ATF traced 108 to crimes, including two murders. The bank robber who killed Garland police officer Michael Moore two years ago used a gun bought at Wilson's flea market booth just three months earlier, according to the ATF. The case underscores a gaping loophole in the Brady Law which requires criminal background checks and gun registration. We witnessed people walking up uh, to the booth with whatever sum of money they wanted to buy a gun with and within 30 to 60 seconds of the time they walked up to the booth they were walking away with a firearm. Despite the fact that there's a uh, Brady bill that requires a criminal background check, Absolutely. that did not apply Nope, that was not even a consideration. No paperwork, no questions, no nothing. Just pay your money and take your gun. The Brady Law does not apply to the hundreds of gun shows and flea markets held across Texas. It only affects federally licensed firearms dealers. If a gun owner claims to be selling his private collection, no background check is required under the Brady Law. I think it's too easy to, to, to buy guns. I think, I think guns are just they're too available. Ken Brown should know. Last summer, Brown, who was wanted for murder, shot a Dallas police officer on a crowded downtown street. The officer survived injury because of his bulletproof vest. You can buy guns from some dealers without a license at the gun show. You can basically get high caliber guns, you know. See, a lot of guns are available on the street of low caliber, but the higher caliber guns aren't so easy to get. That's what everybody wants? Well, yeah, if you're doing you know, the wrong thing, of course, you want, you want high caliber guns. After a crazed gunman shot up a rush hour commuter train in New York six years ago, Carolyn McCarthy won election to Congress on an anti-gun violence campaign. The shooter killed McCarthy's husband and left her son paralyzed from a head wound. On the gun shows, uh, if we don't close the loophole, thousands, thousands, of illegal guns are finding their way to illegal buyers, criminals, and those guns then come back into all of our states, uh, certainly not just Texas, but they end up in New York, and they end up killing somebody, and that's wrong. Earlier this year, McCarthy sponsored a bill to require Brady Law background checks at gun shows or any event exhibiting 50 or more firearms for sale. But the House defeated McCarthy's gun show bill. McCarthy tried to close the Brady loophole because a murder weapon used in the Columbine school shootings had been purchased at a gun show. It's a very powerful weapon. It's very intimidating looking too. So all these are variations of the Tech-9. These are the type of weapons that were used in Columbine. After Columbine, some Colorado students bought a Tech-9 to prove how easy it is for teenagers to buy firearms at a gun show with no questions asked. They didn't check his ID or write down his name or run a background check. Cash just carry. cash and carry. So that really opened my eyes to the problem. Here's another eye opener. The hundreds of confiscated weapons currently lining the ATF's gun vault in Dallas came from just three illegal arms dealers working out of gun shows. Well, gun shows are regularly held here at the Dallas Convention Center and other public buildings in North Texas, and some cities are now wondering if they should stop renting to them. Well, today I talked to Bob Norman, a longtime Fort Worth gun show promoter who says he's voluntarily going to require his dealers to be licensed and comply with the Brady check. Gloria? Now, Robert, we have heard gun advocates say time and time again that the best way to keep criminals from getting guns is to enforce the laws that are currently on the books. Well, Gloria, one problem is the ATF only has a handful of agents to enforce the laws and the guns laws here in an 11-county area of 4.5 million people. And also there's a question of penalties. Uh, you can get more time in prison for selling drugs and for s illegally selling guns. We've also looked at cases where often uh, there are crimes committed, but there's not an unlawful possession charge filed. And there's plenty of evidence in other cities that you have a zero tolerance for guns. It'll substantially reduce gun violence, but that'll take more prosecutors and police. Now, tomorrow night, I'll have a look inside the mind of the mass killer. What makes these gunmen kill so many people. Gloria John. All right. Thank you very much, Rob. I think when you get to the point that I was, it's basically war. Basically, I'm declaring war. I mean, if I... Doug Feldman launched his private war against innocent victims with a powerful semi-automatic handgun. 
No laws on the books could stop Feldman or most of the other mass killers responsible for an epidemic of random violence. We talked with Feldman shortly after he arrived on Texas death row. It's a rarely heard story because mass killers usually commit suicide. I mean, if I saw you on the street, I might have shot you. I might have shot that guy right there. I might have shot this guy right over here. Didn't really give a... The Brady Law's criminal background check prevented a licensed dealer from selling a gun to Feldman because he had a drug conviction. But he still got a gun. You can look in the newspaper and buy from an individual with no intervention by any kind of federal or state authorities or no registration or anything else. So it's just a commercial tra transaction like buying a used car or a used piece of furniture. So it was that simple. A few weeks later, Feldman turned into a real-life Terminator. A service station security camera caught Feldman on his motorcycle randomly shooting one of two truck drivers to death. He later wounded a third man before getting caught. You know, I feel like I was exceedingly sparing. As I had 400 rounds of ammunition, I could have easily done a Ben Brook. I could have easily shot 30 or 40 people before they caught me. This will then give them uh, the notoriety or, or, or the kind of name and fame uh, that they never had during life. Dr. Greg Sadhoff, a psychiatric consultant for the FBI, says mass killers begin building destructive fantasies as early as age 10. Sadhoff says mass killers believe they were never treated fairly and that everyone else is to blame. It reminds me of the volcano where from the outside you may see what looks like a peaceful mountainside with sheep grazing, whatever, but inside this, uh, this core of rage burns. Feldman was an SMU graduate, financial consultant, and appeared successful. I don't know, life just seemed unfair, you know. I would see things on the news where people like JFK Jr. just had millions fall into their lap because their great-grandfather was some kind of robber baron. And this guy just has some sort of Cinderella life. And at some very basic level, that really pissed me off. Seemingly insignificant events like that can trigger a suicidal shooting spree. Kind of like, you screw me, I'm going to shoot you for it. That's the frame of mind I was in which is what happened. <laughs> a lot of people go through life balanced on the precipice. It's when something happens to them that they fall over the edge. Roger DePew pioneered criminal profiling at the FBI. Now he teaches companies how to recognize warning signs of potential violence. In all of those situations, there's, there's a vengeance that's uh, that plays a role and that I have a right to strike back. They've pushed me down so hard, so long, that I have a right to strike back and I don't care what happens to me, somebody's gonna pay for this. Was I justified in doing it? Not legally, but maybe in some other ways. Have we done something wrong as a society? Are we reaping what we sowed? As we become more uh, uh, insulated in our own lives, um, the sense of community is, is disappearing. And if that can't be filled by, by family, if that can't be filled by work, then uh, it may be filled by the darkness that ultimately uh, consumes uh, the individual and, uh, and those around him. Yeah, I wasn't ready to die, but I was damn sure angry enough to kill somebody else. <laughs> I've never met one like that one. For every Doug Feldman, there are a hundred more like him, according to the profilers, but they say many of those people take a different path because somebody comes along that makes a critical difference in their lives. Now, tomorrow night in our series, we'll take a look at who is supplying the banned assault weapons in our communities. You may be surprised to learn that it might be your local police department. Police weapons once carried by officers are now ending up in the hands of criminals. Channel 8's Robert Riggs joins us with an investigation that has found hundreds of thousands of used police guns that have been put back into circulation. Robert? John, uh, more than a thousand former police guns were reportedly linked to crimes last year alone. And this summer, a neo-Nazi went on a shooting rampage at a Jewish community center in California and later killed a mail carrier with a gun sold by a Washington State Police Department. Well, when a used police gun enters the retail market, the individual buying it can resell it virtually to anyone with few restrictions. 
Now, the most sought after used police gun is the banned assault weapon. The rifle will see the AR-15, D. Short, the uh, short stock. A new supply of assault weapons has been showing up on gun dealers' racks from an unlikely but legal source. Open the door! Police departments are unloading thousands of their used guns on the civilian market, even though it is now illegal for manufacturers to produce assault weapons. State and local law enforcement agencies can legally do that because their guns are exempt from the assault weapons ban. We are concerned that there's already too much gun violence, there are already too many guns, and police departments should not be in a position where they are adding to the supply. Given the sheer volume number of weapons that are on the streets, a hundred more one way or another is not going to be a significant risk. Earlier this year, Haltom City traded its used assault weapons and more than 100 other firearms to a Fort Worth area gun dealer in exchange for 22 new weapons. Garland legally traded more than 100 of its used service guns and confiscated firearms to Bachman Pond and Gun Shop in Dallas for new ones. Garland's chief declined to comment. Just because a police agency sells its used weapons to a federally licensed firearms dealer, is there any assurance, though, that gun will not end up in the wrong hands? That doesn't prevent someone, for example, uh, from purchasing a, a firearm, uh, making it part of a private collection, for example, and then turning around and selling it uh, without the same kind of background checks or investigations uh, that we require federally. Since no more assault weapons can be legally manufactured for the civilian market, the supply of used police guns has become a valuable commodity. Gun dealers actively solicit police trade-ins. It's so profitable that three years ago, the gun manufacturer Glock swapped the Dallas Sheriff's Department more than $47,000 worth of new pistols in an even exchange for the deputy's 10-year-old models. News 8 investigation found that the Texas Department of Public Safety traded more than 4,200 of its used service weapons to a manufacturer in exchange for new guns. For most law enforcement agencies, it's a budget issue. Doing the trade with the manufacturer in exchange for new guns saved the taxpayers about $2 million. Um, but we only, like I said, we only, we only sold those guns back to the gun manufacturer itself. Police departments across the nation are also selling confiscated guns once used in crimes. This website advertised an auction of guns from an Oregon sheriff last week. A similar auction in California of 10,000 guns included this 25 caliber Raven handgun confiscated by the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. It was legally sold to cheaper than dirt guns in Fort Worth. A year later, that gun ended up in the hands of a gang member involved in a drive-by shooting. Two years ago, the Irving Police Department traded assault weapons and 40 millimeter grenade launchers for new firearms. The grenade launchers ended up advertised for sale at $3,500 apiece on the website of a licensed dealer in Idaho. The website also sells extremist literature that is popular with militia groups. Now Irving has changed its policy and only sells its used weapons to other police agencies. We realize that we are the ones, besides the general public that's at large out there, we don't want them to face it. We sure don't want to face one of our own weapons ourselves. Law enforcement sources say that's exactly what happened in Waco. Some of the weapons in the Branch Davidian's arsenal were used police guns bought at gun shows. But today we learned some additional information about that gun used in the Fort Worth drive-by shooting. A cheaper than dirt guns in Fort Worth bought that Raven handgun from the police auction for $15 and then resold it for $30. The dealer declined to tell us who they sold it to. Well, federal law enforcement agencies are required by federal law to destroy all of their used guns, and the police departments in Dallas and Fort Worth tell us it is a matter of policy that they destroy their used police guns and confiscated guns. John? All right, thanks a lot, Robert. Well, for more information on guns and gun safety, log on to our website at wfaa.com slash now.